Hey, it's Pete Can, the Laughter Man, and today's episode is slightly different because it's not laughter yoga led today. It's all about laughter, and I interview a doctor, Dr. Brian Kaplan, who studies and teaches actually reverse a bit of reverse psychology, and it's really, really interesting the way he uses humour to um, work with his patients when it comes to sort of giving up smoking and gambling, and you know we touch, we dive into lots of different places, and and just to let you know on this one, when he says pin. He means a badge, okay? That's what it, or a button, sorry, a button. He means badge. Because at the beginning, he was talking about buttons and I didn't know what he was talking about, but he was talking about if, if you're from the UK, badges, basically. Those little badges that you put on. So anyway, I hope you enjoy it. It was really entertaining. It was really good to uh, get to know somebody that uses humour and has also met Patch Adams as well, which is really, really, it was just amazing just hearing his story. So like I say, I hope you enjoy this this episode. If you want to, if you want to find more, of course you want to find out more about laughter yoga and laughter and laughter therapy and all of the good stuff that comes with laughter. You want to subscribe to my channel and you want to press that little notification bing so you get a little bing every time you uh, you every time I put a video out, which is going to be quite regular. Uh, so I'm putting laughter videos out about how laughter can help you in your workplace, how laughter can help with your mental health and mental well-being, how laughter can help us just generally in life connecting with us with others. Anyway, that's all about laughter. This channel's all about laughter, all about laughter yoga. Hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. And uh, it's me and Dr. Fishhead. <laughs> enjoy. Hi guys, welcome to Laughter and Positivity with Pete and today I am joined by Dr. Brian Kaplan who is a medical doctor specialising in the use of reverse psychology and humour to provoke aha moments in people leading to meaningful change. Brian, how are you today? I'm very happy today. I had the second vaccination. I went in wearing my fish head. I went in wearing a fish head and my mask and I went in like this. People were smiling, people were laughing and I was delighted to have the vaccination and to make people laugh. It was a great afternoon. Thank you. Amazing, <laughs> amazing, amazing. Where did you get the fish head from? Uh, do you know, I didn't create this persona, Dr. Fisher, that a long time ago, my wife just bought me this. And this guy that made this, he made all sorts of sculptures out of these things, but he made the fish head and she bought that. He made big things as well. And he became quite famous and stopped making this, but not before I bought one other reserve fish head. And then I sort of adopted this, wearing it and sort of Dr. Fish head grew from there, Pete. Amazing, amazing. So, so, when, so when you say, I mean, so obviously, like talk talk me through your doctorhood i suppose how, how you became oh, a doctor pleasure. And... sure pete um you know the first thing like what happened here why am i using comedy and reverse psychology in medicine and therapy the first thing that that i can think of the earliest memory that i can think of that 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 thing, that gives a harbinger of this what was to come is my my mother always remembers that when i was going to sunday school um, and, and uh, there was a girl in the lift scheme that was about a year older than me in the class above me. And she and my mother said, you always make this girl laugh in the car with whatever you're doing. And I don't even think I was trying to make anyone laugh, but I had a sort of sense of absurdity. So I think the, the sort of fish in my head sort of was there even before I put it there, if you know what I mean? I had a sense of absurdity. I was a bit like that, but I never thought I'm going to do something with comedy. At 16, I thought I'd become a doctor because it maybe, you know, I didn't really know what to do, but I thought that's helping people. And it's a very broad church. There's a lot of different things you can do in medicine. I'll find something. But when I found myself in medical school, that's not what they taught me. They didn't teach me how to work with people. They taught me how to treat disease. Even though they do say, don't talk about the heart murmur in bed 27. That's Mrs. Williams. But when it comes to the teaching about disease, they say, go and listen to that heart murmur. That was the problem. So they paid lip service to treating whole people. So I explored holistic medicine, almost anything that you can think of, including colonic irrigation, rebirthing, fasting, juice fasting, healing, numerology, crystals, homeopathy, acupuncture, absolutely everything. And particularly those types of medicine that were, that were 
whole person that 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 focused on the mind body connection this was after i finished so it was a six-year program plus internship but after that i was free at last seven years of training i was i was free to explore and so the story carries on and i i, I met like-minded people through holistic medical associations and things like things like that very very nice people and that felt a relief because i wasn't surrounded by them at medical school and my at the same time, my father had always been a funny man. He was being able to stand on his feet and tell jokes or see, sing a funny songs from the war. He'd fought in the Second World War. He's a relentlessly enthusiastic and cheerful person. So I have well, sort of inherited um, that of it. But again, I didn't do anything with it. And then I met Patch Adams in London. Now, you must know of Patch Adams, Pete, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that was, that really was a powerful moment. It was the British Holistic Medical Association that brought Patch out for a day seminar. And that really, I couldn't believe it, what he was doing. And when I read his, you know, his story, I think it's called House Calls or his book, um, I was just blown away that he just followed his instinct and his love. And and, and it's always, I always find it really interesting that the movie about Patch, uh, it's called Patch Adams, was really decimated by the critics. But actually having met Patch, I thought Robin Williams did a damn good job of, of, of portraying him. I really did think so. And I thought it was rather cruel, but anyway, um, I'm sure the makers of that movie are crying all the way to the bank. I see it's taken more than $95 million. So the, the <laughs> audiences disagreed. <laughs> audiences disagreed. They liked the clown doctor. And he really was. He was a clown doctor. And then, you see, I knew I could never be a clown. It's not, you know, clown is a very specific thing. Clowning. I've gone to clowning classes to learn about clowning, but I'm, I, I'm not a clown. I'm not a natural clown. It's very physical. He is. And so I just carried on. I mean, I just carried on practicing whole person orientated medicine and enjoying it and giving a lot of time to consultations. But I, I think, you know, I was always looking for a chance to smile or to lift people, to let them, hopefully they would li be lifted a little bit or from the consultation, go out a bit bushy tailed or smiling a bit, not thinking specifically, but to do that. But, you know, just, it was part of the way I worked. And then one day, a friend of mine who was a, a psychotherapist that I deeply respected, um, sent me and it, you know, this was in, before the internet. So this was 96, maybe 95, 95, 96. No internet. So basically, a piece of paper came to me in the post that had been torn out of a psychology magazine. And it advertised a seminar at Surrey University with a man called Frank Farrelly and it said something about provocative therapy and it said he uses jokes to help his patients. And I thought, I've got to hear this guy. I've got to go. Next thing that happens is that I get a note that it's cancelled. And, you know, normally if it's cancelled, you get a feeling that, ah, oh, what is this? They haven't got enough people there. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, forget it. But they offered something, I don't know, it wasn't much more than a free lunch or something, if I would leave the money with them and come at the later date. So I thought, well, you know what? I really would like to see who this character is. And therefore, and I remember the date of it was the 1st of June, 1996. Beautiful a summer's day at Surrey University. I don't know if you've been to Surrey University, but it's a real campus. They've got green grass there and willow trees. And I just remember, I can see it. It was such an important day that I could see it so vividly, the actual day. It's really vivid. And it was lovely. The sun was shining. And I went into this room and the guy came on with a big stomach. I don't know what you call a tie that's like a jewel with a leather thong coming down. It's got a name. It's got a name, but I can't remember. You know what this is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. American, American as apple pie, big, stronger glasses, belly, like really bass baritone type of voice, very strong. And he started talking about the use of provocative therapy. He didn't like the term reverse psychology, but I do like it because I think people can relate to it a bit. When you say provocative therapy, then what the hell you mean? And it's got a negative connotation, provocation, you see. But he was talking about how, if you, you just had a blackboard there, he spoke for half an hour. The rest of the seminar was pure demonstration. But for that first half an hour, he explained that by taking the side of the problem, uh, instead of the side of the patient or the client, you will provoke the, the patient or client to 
to, to disagree with you and stand up on for himself or herself. As he said, that when you provoke people with a affection in the heart and a twinkle in the eye, these low self-esteem people, which he called doormats, he said these doormats rise up on their hind legs and defend themselves, apologizing, and he apologized for mixing metaphors. This is what he did. So he explained it all, but that, and I was thrilled. You know, I was thinking, great. This sounds wonderful, but that was nothing. When I saw him start to demonstrate, to work with someone on the stage, you know, I noticed that I felt my shirt getting wet. I was crying, but crying with laughter and crying, crying with laughter and crying that I'd just arrived. I knew this is what I'm going to do. I knew, I absolutely thought this, this is it. I'm going to rush this moment. This demonstration is up. I'm going to rush to the list so that I can be the one on stage because I've always had the attitude that, you know, do it. Don't just hear about it. Go up on stage. Just who cares what other people think? Who cares if they know what my problem is? I'm not going to bring up my worst, deepest thing. I'll bring up something that's real. And I went up there and well, well, before I went up there, I mean, as I say, I had this profound experience and then I worked with him and it had such a powerful effect on me, the session he did with me. And then I just became a student. And so since 96, since June 96, this is what I've done and loved doing it. So, but it took me a while, took me a while. So for people who think, when do you get a chance to do what you really meant to do in life? It took a while, um, you know, so but since then I do this. Amazing. Sorry, that's a long, a long. No, speaker. no, no. It's really good. It's really good. So it's um. So so so. Talk me through what you do then. That's probably the the you know would be. Really okay. So what I did, like I'll talk to you what I learned from him, and then what I have brought to this field, uh, Pete. Mm -hmm. um, what I learned from Frank was you can say anything to anybody if you do it with affection in the heart and a twinkle in the eye. Okay. Now what does this does this mean? It means the famous therapist or counsel, father of counseling, Carl Rogers, said that most therapy or counseling, or well, didn't have the word counseling before him, but most therapy depend, the quality of it and the effects and the results depend not on the theory, not on the knowledge or stature of the, of the psychotherapist, but on three qualities inherent in the psychotherapist. One is authenticity. In other words, if you sense that he's not really, or she is not really embodying and feeling what she's saying, you won't take it. Number two is empathy. You have to feel that the person is trying to feel that he or she is in your shoes and going through it. You need to feel that. And the third one, Rogers called unconditional positive regard or simply warmth. Unconditional positive regard is, an, is very difficult. That means that everyone that comes in, you give unconditional love. I mean, that's okay if you're enlightened or something, but to mm. do it in everyday life, you can try that. You can think about yeah. it, right? Be warm. And so, but what Frank Farrelly came out of that school, you see, he came out of the, my teacher, Frank Farrelly, came out of that school of counseling. He dropped out of a seminary. He was going to be a Catholic priest. He dropped out of the seminary and he entered uh the university of wisconsin to study to study uh psychiatric social work psychiatric social work that was his qualification but he got a job at mendota state institute with inmates that were suffering from severe psychosis and what they were doing there they were trying to test so this was in the late 50s 60s they were trying to test whether schizophrenia and psychosis could respond to this rogerian technique very few people would use it those, those techniques now in schizophrenia but nevertheless they had inmates there and they tried to do it and he had 90 90 nine zero interviews with a severe schizophrenic who was on medication and an inmate in the hospital and nothing worked didn't touch this 90 interviews is possible only in an inmate you know i mean it's every day five days a week so eventually built up to 90 so he what he he says to this day, he does not understand what happened, why he did what he did. But instead of using the unconditional positive regard and trying to get to support the patient, there's a way of doing counseling. It's not as simple as that. I mean, there's a way of doing Rogerian counseling. Instead of doing that, the guy kept saying to him, I'll never get out of here. There's no solution to my problem. I'll always be on medication. My life is a disaster. He suddenly said, you know what? I agree there's no solution to your problem. I agree with you. And he said that when he described, he said 
the effect of this statement was electric. He couldn't, the patient could not believe that the therapist had said this. He said, what do you mean? And so Farrelly said to him, well, you know, I've spoken, he's getting the pictures, think, wow, there's some animation here. There's some, there's some there's spark of life in this guy. Well, you know, I've tried everything I know, all the things they've taught me, it hasn't touched you. So now I'm beginning to think that I'm wrong in my optimism and that you are correct, that you're right. Maybe you will never get out of here. And that, the first tool of provocative therapy was born that day. And that tool is called there is no solution to your problem. And so the patient defended himself and he did brilliantly. This is, you know, this is how the story of a life, you know, unfolds, Frank Farrelly's life. And he, so Farrelly carried on just treating me, he said in six weeks, this guy had been discharged for, from the unit. A few months later, he writes about in his book, Provocative Therapy List. A few months later, he came off medication altogether and then he was discharged. He was discharged, right? And then Farrelly went on to try this and other clients and patients in the hospital. But the story has an interesting ending. Many, many years later, Farrelly is somewhere in Madison, Wisconsin. Madison's a beautiful, beautiful university city in, in Wisconsin, by the way. Um, he, ran, he went to a restaurant out of town. And there, the maitre d' in this very posh restaurant was this guy from the from the that there's the first patient very successful look you know smart and he saw Farrelly and he said oh Mr. Farrelly I always hoped I'd see you again the meal is on me the drinks anything you want it's all on me and Frank Farrelly said and damn right it should be for all I did for you <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that's the story and he carried on developing it so he he made some rules and the golden rule is that you only provoke with humor first of all i've emphasized this rule get permission like i'm going to be doing a an hour on clubhouse in eight o'clock this evening i'll never work with someone in this way unless i get absolute permission i've read their profile that i can see they're not a a, 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 a recovering person from some trauma or, you know, you can, you can get, mm -hmm. but you get the mission. I say to patients, do I have your permission to be provocative, absurd, ridiculous, cheeky, crazy, politically incorrect? Can I say whatever I want if I think it can have an effect on you? And then they say yes. And I ask this every time because sometimes they'll say no, about one in 20, they'll say, no, I'd rather just talk today. And then I just completely, um, respect that. So he, he invented some of these tools of provocative therapy. For example, there is no solution to your problem. Then straightforward reverse psychology. Do more of the same. Do more of the same. You see a smoker say, well, what do you smoke? What type of cigarettes? Oh, Marlboro Light. Isn't that a woman's cigarette? I said to the guy, I says, no, 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 no. That's better. There's less tar. I said, no, no. Do me a favor, I said. This has a simple one. Do me a favor. Just smoke the red Marlboros as much as you want between now and next week, next session. But I've come to you to give up smoking, he says. No, 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 it's all part of the plan. This is what you do. Smoke as many as you want of the red, like, a, like the Marlboro man on the horse. Just enjoy it for one. But I said I want to give up. I'm not, you can't. He starts shouting at me that he has to give up. You see, this is how it works. If you do it in this warm way, even though they know you're doing it, it still works. Now, what have I done? What have I brought to the table? And it's been almost 20 years work this, and Frank Farrelly saw it in the beginning what I was doing. I came to the conclusion that what you provoke or what you make fun of in people is not the whole person. If you joke about the whole person, then you're demeaning the whole person. But I'm sure you've heard of sub-personalities or sub-selves, like the inner child, the inner critic, the inner pusher, the what, you know, these, my feeling is that many psycho psychologists have agreed on the existence of these subcells, even Freud's ego, super ego, id, uh, Jung, all the archetypes. Here's the here's the theory that I brought to it, and that is, if one of these inner voices is too loud, it has grabbed the megaphone and dominating all the other voices. You see, and taking up the oxygen, as they say on Clubber, taking up the oxygen in the room. <laughs> if they do, if one of the voices is doing that. It's the other voices will dislike it. It will unbalance the individual. So what I feel that I'm doing when I use humor and, and, and I will go for that voice. And if I can find a button, I've designed 170, my wife and I, 170 different buttons 
for example, and I can show you a couple in a minute if you want it, but to, to make fun or to congratulate that voice that is too loud. And as Mark Twain has said, against the assault of humor, nothing can stand. Okay, so I'll make buttons of the voice and then I'll play with them having had uh, permission. So what we've so what we've got here is is your what you do, and I've I've looked at your side and everything. What you do is you're promoting something that is so essential. It's that if you laugh and smile, you'll live longer, no doubt. Even smiling. Do you know that photographs of people? If you take photographs of sportsmen and then you look who how long they look, the ones that were photographed smiling live longer than the ones that didn't smile. Unbelievable. Okay, so smiling even is good for you, but laughter, as you well know, all the benefits of laughter, stress, muscular relaxation, immunity, deeper breathing, exercise, endorphins, encephalins, cardiac protection, all these and more. You know all about these. And it is true. It is true, 100% true, that it doesn't matter what you're laughing at, as long as you are laughing, right? So all the mm -hmm. chuckle clubs and the work you do as a, life, a laughter coach has a tremendous physical benefit, no matter what the people laugh at. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do agree, okay. yeah. And now, but when we want to take it into the realm of psychotherapy and psychology, individual cases, when, once again, if you are happy, if you are happy and you are, endorphins are up and encephalins and your heart is nice rhythm and you're breathing. Isn't that the ideal sucker physiological state in which to discuss an issue in your life? This is the, this is the, this is the, how it's brought into the realm of psychotherapy and counseling. Okay. And then even at the spiritual level, body, mind, spirit, you've noticed gurus and people chuckle about life, the divine comedy. So I believe this, this laughter and comedy goes right through health, body, mind, and spirit. But you haven't let you, you haven't even got a word in yet, Pete. So go for <laughs> it. <laughs> Well, it doesn't, no, it doesn't matter, though. It doesn't matter, bro, because, you know, I'm learning. I'm learning, and it's just, you know, like you mentioned Clubhouse. That, that, that's the power of Clubhouse. That, you know, we met on Clubhouse, and then I reached out and said, look, I'd love to have a chat with you because, you know, you're right. You know, so what I practice is laughter yoga, so it is, it is the, the, the fact that, you know, the body doesn't know the, the difference between a fake laugh and a real laugh. We can laugh for no reason. We don't need humour. We don't need... But I suppose the spin that I put on it, I like to be the entertainer. That's the, that's the vibe that, I, um, that I'm throwing out. But also the fact that I believe, well, I don't, I don't believe, I know, because it works for me. It's like if you're laughing, you're in a higher vibration. And I love yeah. it up there because you, you're more creative, you're more engaged, you're more focused. You, 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 things you touch are quite easily moved as well. And, and that's where I'd like to dive in a little bit, if that's all right, Brian. So what, what sure. you on, on that side of things? A quick interlude for you. I hope you're enjoying today's interview and getting lots of knowledge when it comes to laughter and laughter yoga. Now, if you want to find out more about how laughter can benefit your life, why not subscribe to my channel below and press that little notification bell and get a notification anytime a new video comes out. Now, on with the interview. Oh, yes, this is what I'm saying, is that you are ultimately more optimistic when you're smiling and laughing. And therefore, if we now look at your issues, so what I'm doing, is I'm talking to people and we're talking about sad things, but I've got permission to look at it from an absurd way. If you ask me exactly what goes in my head when I'm doing it, it's as if while they're telling their life story, I see a movie, you know, and, and sometimes it's very accurate. I don't know that people talk about remote viewing. Or I don't know, but sometimes it's very accurate. They can't believe it, this movie that I'm seeing, that I'm hearing and that I'm seeing. And then I, what I want to do is to subvert that movie, make it into a pink, panther you know make it into a, a, a real crazy comedy and just turn it around and subvert it and that's what i give them back the subverted form but they they're laughing but but on the other hand we're touching every now on very painful and difficult issues but then we take them back to the laughter as an anchoring space where they're feeling good and out of the whole you know i interviewed comedians for are you feeling funny it's called it's called it's on apple podcast and i think uh stitcher is it called for pcs mm -hmm. but i interviewed 17 top british comedians and you know no one was paid a penny no one was everyone had to come in i didn't even get taxi fare they thanked me for this session 
And I, I had everything to thank them for. I, they had come in, that was my podcast, they had given up their time, but they thanked me because it was a fun conversation for them. And many comedians, you know, they're very deadpan, you know, when, they, mm -hmm. when they're giving their stuff, etc. You aren't, I'm sure, because you've got to laugh with your, in your laughter coaching sessions, etc. But, that, but that's, that's what I was going to ask, Brian, actually, because, you know, that, that's something that I'm interested in as well, is that with, with comedians, because you know, you, you, you hear about obviously these tragic stories where comedians take their lives because they're actually behind yeah. closed doors, you know, and obviously Robin Williams being one of them, you know, it's like be, be, in, in, in the front, they're, 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 they're entertainers, they're, they're, they're craftsmen of, of what they do. But actually, you know, how often do they actually laugh at their own jokes or at their own craft or how often do they top themselves up with laughter because i think that's that's what's missing i think from from stand-up comedy okay i'll be i'll answer that question and i'll give specific examples as well <laughs> okay so yeah i can tell you a person who can laugh because i can see you can you're capable of barely laughing first of all there's different types of laughter with real laughing from your belly, you know. <laughs> and we're both laughing, it's genuine, right? It's not difficult for you and me to just to do that, okay? Then there's a sort of high laughing. <laughs> and then there's even worse, a sort of chuckle. Huh, huh, that's funny. That's a comedian's compliment. Huh, huh, that's funny. But not every comedian. My very, very good friend, Arnold Brown, I don't know if you know his comedy, but he's capable of laughing. Um, he's really capable of laughing, barely laughing. I was at a concert with Matt Lucas. He made a joke, uh, Arnold Brown, I could tell it here if you wanted, but, and I, Matt Lucas literally jumped out of his chair. He was laughing so loud. So there are comedians that can laugh at their own work, but not many. Actually, Jerry Sadovitz, you won't see laughing, you know, you won't catch him laughing. And I know, I do know him a bit personally, but you won't catch Jerry Sadovitz laughing. Uh, and my, many, many can't laugh, but there are some that can laugh. At their, at their, and that's so sad that they don't get the benefits of the laugh to themselves. Yeah, yeah. So, so where, um, I mean, I, I, I looked on your website as well before, before sort of obviously having a little chat, and you've got the acronym, I, can, I think that's how you say it, acronym. Of yeah, smile. acronym. Yeah, acronym. Smiley. So, so, yeah, so do, do you want to just run through that? What, what yeah, that means? sure. Okay, so Smiley, this is something I did many years ago to remind myself of all the benefits of laughter. Um, I'm, you know, the great expert on this was a guy called Dr. William Fry of Stanford University, who spent 25 years um, studying gelatology. That is the study of laughter, gelatology, or unless it's gelatology, I suspect it's gelatology. Anyway, so he, I looked at his work and uh, Patch's work, etc. I'm sure there are more benefits now, but S in Smiley, S stands for stress. So we can actually measure before and after a bout of belly laughter, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol. Those are the stress hormones. Or if you're in America, norepinephrine, epinephrine, um, and cortisol. So you can measure those and they come down after laughter. Muscular relaxation can be measured with electromyography. So you can show that the muscular relaxation, the muscles are more relaxed after about of laughter. I stands for immunity, and it's just well known. All the immunity, IgG, IgM, goes up with laughter. It's amazing. It actually happens. That's why this study um, where they showed that when they took sportsmen at more or less the same age, baseball players or whatever, the ones that were smiling, that's all they did. Is he smiling or not? Now let's see how long he lived. They, did, they lived another something like 10 years more. The ones that wow. were smiling in their photograph as sportsmen, right? You want to see, look at Ron Gutman's, Ron Gutman's, spelled well, G-U-T-M-A-N. If you look at his, oh, you know all about it. You've been on his, yeah. have a look at his speech on TED Talks. He talks about this, this smile. This, I was blown away by that. I didn't know that he'd done a brilliant TED Talk. It's just fantastic. But that's what he talks about. The smile, the ones that smile, baseball players smiling, lived about 10 years longer. Then, um, uh, lungs. So when you laugh, a belly laugh, if when you're just breathing normally, 20% of the air in your lungs just stays where it is, okay? It doesn't revolve. So then hopefully that some of that 20% will go to the next one. But if you belly laugh, you really expire, you know, you get all the expiration out. And remember in breathing, which is so big today, mindfulness and breathing, it's always prolonging the out breath. And laughter prolongs the out breath. <laughs> you see, you're making a pronounced out breath and that's got that has a fantastic effect so 
So there we have the lungs are cleared out more. And then E stands for several things. Exercise. Uh, they say, you know, 10 minutes of laughter, but that's a long time of laughter. But you can probably get people to laugh for 10 minutes in your classes. So, um, so that they... Um, so that's a form of exercise that's equivalent to half an hour's rowing or something. I've seen that. Then you have endorphins and enkephalins, the natural high making substances made by the body go up after a, a bout of laughter. And then there are recent studies showing that people laugh more, live longer, and also even some cardiac protection. Maybe, you know, a few more, uh, Pete, I don't know. No, I think I think you've ticked all the boxes there, and I love the fact the acronym. Uh, I've said it right. Brilliant. <laughs> it's um, yeah. No, I think that's really really clever the way that you've you've, you've put that there. And it's just uh, because you know the amount you can bang the drum, and you've obviously been banging the drum a little bit longer than I have. You know, or probably a lot longer actually, to be fair, because I only in two thousand and sixteen is when I discovered okay. laughter yoga as a practice. Um, but instantly. I got it. And I was just like, like, why would you not want to, why would you not want to feel in a higher vibration? Why would you not want to feel good about yourself? Why would you not, you know, and, and then finding out you can live longer, you know, you're, you're, you're happier. Like the, I love that smile fact that, you know, that, that looking at the people that just sat there like, ah, and there's plenty <laughs> of them out there, isn't there? There's plenty of them there. Um, Oh, that's brilliant. It's brilliant. So, so who, who, who like inspires you then? Cause you obviously covered a couple of people that you, uh, in comedy, um, in comedy, in this kind, in Britain, in Britain, I think, uh, well, I think Jerry Sadowitz, if you go to a Jerry Sadowitz gig, you won't see anything on TV or anything. He's the only comedian that, only comedian would ever think of asking Channel 4 to take him out of the top 100 uh, comedians because he didn't want to be on the program. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he was in the between 10 and 20, which is pretty uh, incredible. Although with these lists of comedians, um, you know, people will rate, uh, they will rate uh, uh, Alan Carr higher than Lenny Bruce because they haven't heard of Lenny Bruce. Okay, so mm. of the people in Britain, I think Russell Brand is um, particularly intelligent. I went, I once went to talk, I went to a comedy gig, Arnold took me there a very long time ago and it was russell blair uh, arnold was was um supporting russell brand and it was um north london somewhere i can't remember something top of a pub or i can't remember the name of the place but there was only 11 people in the audience 11 okay 11 and they decided they were talking about should we even do this i think another two came and Arnold did his gig, and then Russell Brand went on that. To this day, I will respect him for what he did. He did it as if it could have been Wembley Stadium. You know, he just gave it, right? It's as if, and that's what I think is the right attitude in Clubhouse as well. Do what you do, even if there's three people in the room. Even if there was one, there was one person in the room that I worked with on a habit, and other people left, but I, there was one person that I really, they were really laughing, they stayed in the room, and they benefit. That's enough. That's okay, you know? It's it's okay. I mean, if, it, if this works, other people will get to hear. But so anyway, I really respected him. I think he's a highly intelligent comedian and very, very funny. I think Frank Skinner is a funny, um, is a funny man. I think that he's very, very sharp. I think that he can, he, he's spontaneous. He can improvise and he really gets it. But then there's my friend, Arnold Brown. Um, who I've known all these years and he's my mentor in comedy and he's introduced me to so many, uh, comedians and uh so i love his he's been described as the most laconic comic um in britain um you know one of the line one of his lines he said the last line of the gig he says if there's anything about this gig you had if there's anything about this gig that you don't understand please regard it as significant <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. So, so Brian, near, yeah. so near the beginning, you mentioned that you, you and your wife would create some buttons. So, yes. so I'd be, I'd be quite intrigued. We've probably got about five or so minutes left. So I'd be intrigued. To, okay. Um, let me, okay. You can, you can, um, let's see if they show up here. They're here. They're on a jester's hat. Okay. So there, okay. Now let me do a better way. I'll get a phone. Or it'll take two minutes, right? Okay. So for those of you are are listening at the moment, Brian has stepped away from the camera and the microphone, and uh, he's trying to get uh, uh, his phone, I think, to show the buttons. Um, Absolutely, yes. His, yeah. 
So, and he's back, as you can hear. <laughs> Is this happening live? Is that what's going on? Sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> no, it's not live. I mean, I was listening uh, in. I, you know, okay. I, I must admit, I don't really edit. It's possible that someone's actually watching this, Jimmy. It's actually possible. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm going to show you them on the front. Now, these are buttons. These are actual buttons. What I mean by a button... Like a badge. Is this. Yes, a physical badge. I'll show you one here. It's a physical badge. Here's one that I use if someone says they've got a gambling problem, which is quite a severe problem, right? Can you see that? Yeah, 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 on a roll. Yeah. On a roll soon, that one says, okay? Soon. I'll try and show... It. That's the actual button. That just shows you Did, that I can Brian, wear it. interestingly... Right, you the one button that you chose. Like I, I went to GA. I went to Gamble. Oh, you and did have that. Then, like, some people. Many, many years ago. But you know, that's really interesting. That the fact that that was the button you picked. I can't that, believe like, it. I just took one off this hat that I happened to have them on this jester's hat, and I just took one, you know, for a common problem. And that I can't believe it. But you know, these things happen. It's very strange. Eh? I mean, I, yeah, I don't yeah. Understand it. So, 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 you, so, so, so the premise of it is that, that, that you put the badge on your lapel and they just wear it. Well if, you, well, if you had that issue, you know part of you, put it this way. If you had that issue, and that's much easier to talk about if you're saying you knew you had that issue. And thank mm -hmm. you for saying that, actually, because you could have just carried no, on. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to share that. that. No, yeah. I do appreciate it very much. Because that then I can then explain to you how this process works. You know there's still a part of you that would enjoy gambling. If you allow that part of you, that voice, the gambler, not the pusher, not the inner critic, not the inner child, but the gambler, that to hell with it, gambling, let's go for it. Mm. You know that voice is there. If that you, the reason that you gamble was that voice became dominant and the other voices couldn't say, shut it down. There are other important things in life. It became dominant. So if I say to you, man, do you know what? Double up. It almost works as a system. Double up. Put down 10 pounds. If it fails, put down 20, 40. It nearly works. Most of the time it works. Whereas a gambler knows that it, deep in his heart, he knows it doesn't work. You see? Yeah. So, yeah, this yeah. Is the, so if we look at habits, and that's interesting. That's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. If we look at habits, I'll show you how we deal with some habits. All right. Let's, let's just look at that category. Mm -hmm. uh, because the categories that we look at problems are physical health, uh, including habits, sex and relationships, work and money, uh, recreation and identity. These are the areas, all right? Mm -hmm. So here we go. Let us have a look. And we are going to look at a classic one. Here you are. This is what I would use for, this is what I'd ask a smoker to wear this button. Fearless smoker. <laughs> <laughs> that's it just wear the button and smoke as many red marbles as you want as long as you wear the button or well, even if you're at home with your wife when when you smoke wear the button because you're a fearless smoker and that's so uh, so what you name a habit for me and i'll see if i've got a button for it name another okay one. uh overeating oh uh, yeah there's two or well, sugar one. sugar's a habit is it oh uh, yeah there, uh, there's three now you've mentioned three that go to that one uh here's one Okay, let's see if we can find it quickly. It takes a few seconds. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, but the one is always hungry, I think it is. And it is, yeah, this is one. It depends on the person. Okay. Always hungry. Yeah. Or, or this one you relate, um, you said sweet, so you probably like chocolate. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Here's a button for you. Chalk hog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so think, go for another habit, another one, anything, addiction, habit, whatever you want. It's perfect. I'm talking on, I'm going to be talking on habits at eight o'clock tonight. So you're letting me practice. Go for it. Yeah, 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 definitely. Well, look, I'll do one more, one more, uh, one more habit that I've got is, um, oh, I don't know, biting my nails. I haven't quite... got time for that. Oh, um, Brian, you let me down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got um, one. That, you see, but I could still use one. You see, I might use, I could still use one that's slightly, I might do this because it's slightly compulsive. Okay. When you bite your mouth. So, do you see yeah. this one? Everything in order. <laughs> doesn't look in order, does it? No, it doesn't at all. It doesn't. It doesn't. And then it's really... my favorite, but you're not gonna you're not gonna 
you're not a coke addict, so but I will show you nevertheless. Um, I'll show you this one because I like it a lot, and it is called how's this one? Okay, yeah, this one I like a lot. A lot of people that this one when they see this one, the 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 people who need this one they really take note. Nose pout, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, but they laugh with it and they love the button. Yeah. So they're often, even when I'm working with Zoom with people, they love receiving the physical buttons and they put it in their purse. So there are different levels you can take this to. You can just keep the button in your purse or in your wallet and it'll still remind you because you'll see it there. Or you can wear it and look in the mirror or you could wear it with close friends and family or you could go out in public. There was a guy, there's another one called On Diet. And the guy put wore the on diet on an airplane. He said he was amazed how people came up and encouraged him. So that was a that was wow. a wonderful uh, effect of of the button. Or you could even make. Ultimately, I would love to have a. I would love to have a YouTube channel where people post their own story of how the button helped them, how they laughed and changed even the button. But that's wishful thinking. But maybe maybe well, why, why is it wishful thinking? Why is it wishful thinking? <laughs> Make it, make it so, Brian. Make it so. It's. Uh, I love. I love it. I love. You should, I love say, it. you should say to me, wishful thinking. I'm not <laughs> the fucking therapist. You're yeah. damn right. Who do you think you are? Thinking of the future. Who do you think you are having a famous YouTube channel where everyone <laughs> says how they kill? <laughs> <laughs> oh brilliant well, look, Brian, I'll, give a, I'll give you one last one you'll like this okay. no. I have, I've got a classic line I've got two classic lines you'll like them one is if anyone comes in and they do saying I'm unhappily married I say to them uh, with permission remember I've got permission to yeah. do this I yeah. say oh my heart goes out to you if you're unhappily married it must be horrific to be unhappily married because I'm happily married and it's terrible <laughs> <laughs> And then if someone comes back after one session, and it does happen, this is not time related. I think you understand in humor that one greater high moment can change a person. You know, it doesn't have to be years of therapy. It's one moment. That's all I'm looking for. One transcendent moment um, in the session. But sometimes they come back and say, I can't believe it. I'm so much better. I said, don't worry, it won't last. I said, <laughs> I love it, Brian. I love it. It's been really, really interesting chatting yeah. to you. And like, I, I could feel there's another conversation in the future. Right. Definitely. Anytime you want, Pete. Anytime you want. I'm watching you. We often in the we often in the same room. I notice, you know. So, anytime you want, any form of collaboration. You doing the same work. You just, it's just from a different angle. You're doing that physical, as I said right at the beginning. I said right at the beginning. In terms of physical benefits. Doesn't matter what you laugh at. Commit drives keep medians crazy that someone laughs at someone wearing a funny hat who isn't doing anything and still gets the same benefit. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's like, yeah, exactly. It, it's it, but that's the that's the crazy thing is the fact that you know all all I teach is like take a deep breath in and just breathe out a laugh. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it takes a it takes about a second to just get into it, and then you're laughing at yourself, laughing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so there's a couple of things left then. So, so first of all, yeah. um, what um, what positive daily habits do you have? Do you have any daily habits you use? Smile, you know, and I suppose with my wife and I, it's always allowed. It's all. It's sort of you know, my son is twenty three. I mean, he, you know, all, all his life, it's been allowed to, we allowed to make, you were allowed to make jokes about each other. For example, in our house, what's not, we don't love it when someone uses the word like unnecessary, you know, I was like walking down the street, you immediately be hit by, oh, were you like walking down the street? You know? <laughs> So that always that happens because and, and that's that's ridding yourself of like I ran a room for a while just for people to rid themselves of this word like. Um and then I had a button for it actually. Uh, you'll quite like this one, I'm sure. Um just the last button. And that is this one. This is one of my favorites because it's not for this one I did for the English language. 
like in uh, like in articulate. In articulate. <laughs> I, I tell you, I cured someone of lycism or Lyke's disease, or whatever you want to call it. He was going like all the time, and he said when he saw that button, just looking at other buttons, you know. So not many people have seen them because my book hasn't come out yet, but it's coming later, August this year almost happy pushing your buttons with reverse psychology um but he said when he saw this button he said i'm not an articulate and that was it he was not going to use like anymore amazing <laughs> amazing amazing so, he mentioned so yeah podcast. yeah just to, to be open to humor be open to smiling be open you know the worst thing is someone makes a joke not funny this isn't funny you know no i can't <laughs> so, no perfect, be open to perfect. humor yeah so, so be ready ready to smile that's what there's my daily tip be ready to smile. Amazing. The amazing. readiness is everything, as Hamlet said. <laughs> readiness is everything. <laughs> and where, where can people find you, Brian, if they want to want to get in touch? Uh, on Clubhouse. Um, you can find me on my website. You can uh, find me on uh, whatever. Web. Uh, I don't do many of the social media. I have got an Instagram page, I've, but I only had the Instagram page so that I could make contact with. I think I told you on your Instagram page, I, you caused me to join Instagram. I didn't even know it. I'm a Luddite. <laughs> I'm a Luddite. I was like Lear's fool or something, you know. I only joined, this is an absolute true story. Peter will confirm it. I wrote to you on Instagram that I only joined Instagram so I could converse with you, so I could meet you. It's a true story. <laughs> That's how good I am at promoting myself, everyone. <laughs> oh, amazing yourself do the opposite of what i do you'll do well you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh brilliant brilliant okay so um so final final thought then brian what sure. three things bring you joy what things do joy uh great sex uh very funny things happening in real life uh and seeing Human kindness, seeing love. I love seeing love. I really have to say that I, I, I love seeing a couple embrace, and you just see that energy that that is created that is more than both participants. That brings me great joy when I see that. And I think most people, but I am particularly thankful when I see. When I didn't have a girlfriend or a wife, I used to feel, oh, I want that, you know. But now I have. I'm married, happily married, as I said, even though it's terrible. I am happily married. <laughs> And, and uh, when I see that now, I just, it opens my heart. It just shows me there's something that we're not meant to be alone. We, our auras or our physical being or our electric charge, that when we come together, there's something special and wonderful. And that, that does bring me genuine heartfelt joy when I see that. Amazing. Brian, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. I enjoyed speaking to you. Anytime you want to do more, uh, more than happy to explore different things with you. Good luck. I'm seeing you. We're in the same team on Clubhouse. Team cool. laughter and joy and happiness. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Cheers, nice Brian. To meet you, Pete. Cheers, bye, bye. Cheers. Bye.